Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Here's your host, Jason A. Meiske. Hello, my friends. Hey, welcome back to the Sample Chapter Podcast. This is episode 197. And this week we are featuring realistic epic fantasy and sci-fi author W.D. Kilpatrick III. W.D. is an award-winning author out of Utah. Uh, We're going to be discussing what makes realistic fantasy, uh, which is what he likes to write, and the fever dreams that led to his books. Uh, These things and so much more coming up here in just a couple of minutes so stay tuned for that interview you're gonna really enjoy it and uh, it was a lot of fun really really enjoyed talking to WD and uh, look forward to everything he has to offer well as for me uh, some of you may have noticed or some of you did notice I have been gone again for a little while Uh, after that bout at work where I was uh, on my own for a few weeks um, Came back and, well, turned out right after that, I had my knee surgery finally. I had a partial knee replacement, a uni, that they call it. And I have been home learning to walk ever since. And, uh, so yeah, naturally I couldn't do, I didn't have time right before the episode, or right before the surgery to do a new episode. And since then, it's been learning how to walk. (laughs) Learning how to walk. Uh, plus, my setup for the show is in a, a downstairs uh, basement garage area, and I wasn't allowed to do stairs until just a few days ago. But I'm doing really well now, uh, aside from a little stomach bug I think I've, I may have picked up. But otherwise, I'm doing well, I'm getting around better, and uh, maybe going back to work here fairly soon. We'll see what the doctors say in a couple of days. Yeah, but uh, what was fun, though, is even even in that downtime, uh, this past weekend, November 20th, uh, we went up to visit my parents. It was my mom's 70th birthday, so we had a big shindig up there, and a whole bunch of, whole bunch of family got together and friends, and my birthday is actually in a couple of days, so we did a big 120th birthday for all of us, and uh, real special for that was... My brother and his kids got to come up, and that was that was really great because I haven't I haven't seen his kids in like six years. They live out in California, so that was really great to to get to see them. And uh, man, they were just fantastic. I can't believe how much they've grown. Oh gosh, but uh, yeah, it was a fantastic weekend. Um, I even got to go earlier in the day Saturday. Uh, spent the morning and early afternoon at a uh, an event called the Gifts Galore. They were doing a big Christmas sale, and I got to go and set up a booth and sell some books. Got to Bandit Rising was there, and of course this is up in northern Missouri, so near the location, the actual location of my first book, Nine Mile Bridge. So a lot of people were familiar with the book and, and were aware of it, and so I sold a lot of those too, which thankfully I kind of planned for that and and had plenty of books on hand, but it was, overall, it was a great weekend. Uh, oh man, I just can't can't say enough how great it was to uh, spend some time with mom and, and celebrate her birthday and uh, to to see my brother and his kids and and see everybody. Really, uh, we were really really blessed with uh, how everything went. Yeah, looking forward to seeing everybody again. Hopefully, real soon. Uh, you know, the good thing about being home though is I finally got the energy to get back into my writing. I have been working on NaNoWriMo on book two of Bandit, and that's going pretty well. Um, I had a few days there where I did not feel like getting up. I was mostly just sitting down playing games, honestly. <laughs> but I'm, uh, I- I've been motivated to do a lot of writing, and I've been punching out a couple thousand words a day here lately with uh, Bandit 2. And uh, yeah, still, the plan is still to have that one ready to go coming up this spring, so we'll see what happens, and I'll make sure to let you know when it's ready. Meanwhile, I want to make sure that you know about our sponsors, uh, starting with Scrivener, my favorite writing app. I'm doing all of my writing in in Scrivener, and it, I just absolutely love it, and right now especially, what's really cool is I can, uh, I'm, I'm just writing things as they come to me. I'm writing them as fast as I can, and I don't have to worry about placement because I can always move 
uh, chapters or portions of chapters around later. And I already know of two sections that are going to need to be moved later, but I don't have to worry about that right now because that's one, just one of the many wonderful things about Scrivener. Hey, check out this advertisement for Scrivener and how you can save 20%. Jason here. Hey, I wanted to take a moment and tell you about my favorite writing tool, Scrivener. Now, I know you've heard about Scrivener because their writing software has been embraced by hundreds of thousands of other writers like you and I, from the novice to best-selling novelists. The reason we all use it is because of Scrivener's core concept to bring all the writing tools you use together in a single application. And with tools like automatic backup, character maps, project goals, and let's not forget that amazing corkboard, you can see why I use Scrivener every day. As a bonus for Sample Chapter Podcast listeners, use code CHAPTER for 20% off your desktop version. Scrivener writing software, built by writers for writers. All right, thank you as always to Scrivener. I've been a longtime supporter of the show, and I really appreciate everything they do. I also want to thank Writer's Block Coffee, home to three incredible flavors. They have the signature Writer's Block, the Deadline Dark, and Whiskey Barrel Aged, which is my personal favorite. That's a fantastic drink. Uh, you can order one at a time or set up auto pay so that you never run out. Make sure you click that link in the show notes to get on over there and use coupon code SAMPLECHAPTER for 10% off your order. Finally, I want to thank Pop Goes the Culture Network, home to about uh, home to about half a dozen pop culture related shows, all of them amazing and uh, a lot of fun to listen to. Uh, click that link in the show notes for more. And then uh, yeah, you know what? I think uh, I think that's everything we've got. So, without further ado, let's hop on over to our interview with Fantasy and sci-fi author, W.D. Kilpatrick III. Hello, Sample Chapter listeners. Welcome back to a, a wonderful episode, one that I cannot wait to dive into. Today's guest is W.D. Kilpatrick III. He is an award-winning and critically acclaimed internationally published writer with works appearing in print, online, radio, television, and starting his first publication credit at the age of nine, where he wrote an award-winning poem. Uh, he wrote his first novel at 12 year old, years old and has a whole accolade of honors and awards. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the show, W.D. Kilpack III. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> oh, man. You've got quite the... Uh, quite the list of honors and all that and uh i can't wait to to uh, discover some of that but uh how are you doing i'm doing well that uh you know things are things are you know tooling along that uh I've, the thing is since i've uh, had some novels published um the support from uh people like yourself and and uh readers has really been amazing it is really humbling to have somebody do you know i have people that send me photographs of themselves holding my books and oh, nice. that sort of thing and it just really uh touches a nerve for me to have all that work be appreciated is just uh gratifying isn't a good enough word to describe it oh yeah oh yeah i haven't had anything to that level yet but it's it's a good feeling whenever you find out that, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, who knows if it was the person you were talking to earlier or not, but then later on you find out you got a sale on Amazon or somewhere and like, oh, they really did like me. And uh, <laughs> that's kind of, it's a good feeling. And, and I look forward to the day that maybe somebody's putting on a uh, crocodile Dundee hat and showing me pictures of uh, that they're dressing up like the bandit from my own series <laughs> and stuff. So. <laughs> Someone actually said something to me like that. They said, uh, you know, what, how's it going to be when you go to a convention and there are people dressed up like characters in your book? Oh, yeah. And, and I just stood there with my mouth open because the thought hadn't even occurred to me. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's just amazing that 
some of the things that are out there, conventions and, and a lot of things like that, that uh, really have made this a, a very positive experience. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Are, are you a full-time author? Um, that it's not yet. That uh, that's my goal is a lot of people, they want to, they have all these goals about all these big and world changing things. I'd like to make a living writing. Mm -hmm. That is that I love to write. I love creating. And I've always been that way and to be able to just sit and do that. And, um, you know, just, just be able to, to be comfortable in, in knowing that that's there. That would be a great thing. Um, that uh, you mentioned working from home and uh, when we were talking before the interview and, and uh, I do that, that at least with COVID, uh, I was teaching using Zoom. And uh, so that was, uh, you know, so that made it so that the, that the lockdown wasn't as big of an impact as, as it has, you know, it has been for others. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but yeah, I would love, I'd love to be able to do that, to sit at home and, and write my books and, uh, just keep doing that and have things keep, you know, moving forward. Oh yeah. My gosh. And you know, what I really admire too, is that you've always held on to that dream of writing, having a, uh, your first publication credit at nine, your first novel at 12 years old and being recognized with, uh, from the L Ron Hubbard's writers of the future contest. Uh, I, how did you hang on to that? that love without allowing life to kind of beat you down and, and, you know, I'm like, Oh, I've got to, I got to work. I got to do the day job and not write. How, how did you keep that alive within? Well, as far as not getting beaten down that for me anyway, was that was not the most challenging part that I wrestled for 12 years and, uh, <laughs> You know, Dan Gable says, once you've wrestled, then everything else is easy. And so, you know, I've dealt with a lot of, of things there as far as hard work and pain and uh, that sort of thing. And, you know, and I had my success there. I made the Pan Am team in uh, Greco-Roman. I didn't get to go because I got hurt, but, uh, but I, I made the team. And... So that sort of thing, hard work and being able to endure uh, wasn't the most challenging thing um, for me. And I did put a lot of my major publishing goals on hold for a few years because uh, basically with five kids, that takes a lot of time. And so I, I put things on the back burner a little bit while uh, raising kids. And I still was doing freelancing in terms of of uh, news and and uh, short stories and that sort of thing, but it just it wasn't a question of can I or should I. It was just do it. Mm -hmm. That uh, you know, and, and I've had plenty of you know. A lot of people say, "Well, wow, this it just seemed to happen so quickly and so naturally," and and you know things like that, but. Uh, I have a file folder with all of my rejection letters. It's about three inches thick <laughs> and I keep them and I read them because the ones that actually uh, wasn't just a form letter, then where they actually made comments about why they said no to this particular piece. Oh, every nice. one of those is a teaching opportunity. Yeah. And in my case, a learning opportunity. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I've been described before as just being very stoic about it. And, and I appreciate the observation from people who have said that, but, uh, you know, it still hurts when it happens, but, you know, like I said, with, with wrestling things happen, you get, you get hurt and you got to suck it up and, and go back to work because it, you just don't know if there's going to be a tomorrow. Well, that's a good point. That, that's very well said, too. And I think that's similarly, that's one of the things that kind of clicked for me. And I've you know, long time listeners have heard me tell this before. But six years ago, when I found out I was going to be a grandfather the first time, that's what <clears throat> triggered me to be like, oh, man, I got to get serious. I, I wanted to be an author by now. 
I'm supposed to have books out and I, I had always wanted to finish writing and I was like, yeah, okay, you know what? Enough, enough watching the TiVo first thing in the morning or the DVR or playing games or something or whatever. That's going to be my writing time. And uh, I made it happen from there. And it was just like, yep, yeah, you know, I, nobody's going to write the book for me. I got to do it myself. And, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> so-called living the dream ever since. <laughs> Well, and, you know, the thing with the writing is that I never stopped writing. The, I was still going at it. And so, like Crown Prince, I actually started writing the first draft of it um, oh, nine years ago. Mm. And I wrote the first draft of all eight books in the series. And then uh, there were places where I thought, okay, I'm going to flesh this out later. And so I'd go back. And, you know, and when it came time to do revisions for actual publication, and, and that's actually what I was doing right before uh, talking to you was on book three, I was doing some little tweaks uh, on the last chapter, because that is, uh, you know, due out in December. And I am trying to do a, uh, I don't know, a double dunk. I've got two books that are scheduled to come out in December. And one is book three, Demon Seed, and the other is a science fiction novel that's unrelated that is called Pale Face. Oh, nice. Okay. So you like to, do, do you like writing like that, splitting it up between uh, epic fantasy and uh, sci-fi? Is it kind of a refresher to change it up? Um, it does kind of, of get my juices flowing again, switching from one to the other. Um, there's, the, the foundation of sci-fi and fantasy really is the same, that they tend to be uh, quest books in both cases. And in both cases, they use uh, distortion or exaggeration in order to make a point more clear. And that, that tool is the same in, in uh, both genres. Um, sci-fi can be a little faster for me because it doesn't necessarily require the same amount of research. And I do, with my fantasy uh, writing, I do like to do a lot of research that in terms of world building. And so uh, you may not know that that is the foundation uh, you know, when, when reading it. But for example, in Crown Prince and the New Blood Saga, uh, the foundation of that is in Celtic culture. And I have another series that I've been writing that is based in Viking culture and, you know, that sort of thing that uh, I like to have as, a, as an underlying uh, layer that may not be obvious to a reader, but if it wasn't there, I think it would be obvious. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I'd say so. I mean, that, and that sounds incredible. I love the, the idea of having, the the uh, the different backgrounds and uh, coming in there too that with the throughout the uh, the new blood that's really amazing and I gotta say too looking at this cover for uh, book three uh, demon seed that's that's thrilling indeed that is really exciting looking well I'm I'm sitting here trying not to giggle because what you're <laughs> doing right there is exactly the kind of thing that that just gives me such a charge uh, you know, when readers come up and say things and. And you just hit that same exact chord. And it's just, uh, it's much appreciated that, uh, to have comments like that. So tell us about the, uh, the New Blood. Uh, you've got two books so far. Uh, the one we're going to hear from today, Crown Prince, and then Order of Light, book two. And of course, the forthcoming Demon Seed, book three, coming out in December, Tell us about this, uh, I don't know, fever dream, the thing that, that held on to you for nine years before it finally came out. Well, it's interesting that you said dream, because that is where the story started, is that I had oh. a recurring dream, and it would, uh, it just kept coming. And sometimes it was every day, sometimes it was every week or a few weeks, but it would come back and it would have the same vibrant image and I would literally wake up in tears because it was just so gripping. And so I finally realized, wait a minute, I got to write this. So I started writing and I realized 
at first I was thinking I was going to write a book. And then I realized, well, to get the same sort of emotional impact from writing that scene, it's going to take more than a book. So then I thought I'll write a trilogy. And then I thought it would be six books. And then it's eight. And uh, the actual dream takes place in book four. But it, it needed to have this foundation to, in order to build it up. So when you're dreaming, you know all that. It's instant. You know all the backstory. You know all the relationships. You know everything that's involved because it's right there and it's just shoehorned into your brain in a dream. But when you're writing it, it takes work. And so that was where it started, that I had that dream. And then the main character, Nathar, is... Uh, a character that I've been thinking about writing something with this type of character since college. That uh, when I was in college, I, one of my undergrad majors was in philosophy and I was fascinated by Socrates and Socrates would go into a trance-like state where he would, he called it being seized by the demon of philosophy and he would kind of go into a trance and then he would come out of it with some epiphany, some sort of ground shaking uh, flash of enlightenment. And so I wanted to have something along those lines in, in a character that I wrote someday. So Nathar is seized by the demon of sight. And what that what happens is that he can see the future, he can see into the past. He can sometimes he'll touch things or touch uh, a person and get flashes of uh, their future or their history. And so because he has sight, then he is the guardian of Merrick. Merrick is a nation where uh, mankind was created. And so he's the guardian of Merrick and his father was the guardian before him. And so for two generations, they have seen the future where the royal family is going to be overthrown. And so they've been planning for two generations to escape with the crown prince and in order to be able to bring him back to the throne. And so that is where, in a nutshell, that is crown prince, that the opening chapter is his birth and going through to following uh, Nathar and the wet nurse Darshel as they are escaping the capital of Merrick and uh, trying to find a place to basically hide out until the crown prince can grow up and, and be restored to the throne. Wow. Okay. Oh my gosh. And, and I mean, as much as I want to hear about it, we don't want to spoil crown prince or demon seed and what's coming next, but uh, <laughs> sounds incredible, man. So and you've got these described as realistic epic fantasy. How, how do you come to that? What makes it realistic for you? Well, that's a great question. Um, as far as the realism, there are a lot of fantasy novels out there that they are so far removed from what is more real life mm -hmm. that it's not realistic anymore. And they, so my characters, they, they have... There, there are things that they have to deal with that are real life. There are, uh, they have real needs. They have real responsibilities. They have uh, ramifications to the things that they do. That, uh, and the other thing with that is that magic is not like fireworks. That there are a lot of books where magic is such a huge part of it that it takes over and it can overshadow everything else in my opinion. And so in my books, magic is much more uh, practical. It's more subtle. And I had a reader who said that you claim that magic is more subtle in your work, but if you look and you know how to look, it's everywhere. And the thing with that is that when she said, if you know how to look, that to me said I was successful <laughs> because if it took, if you know how to look, otherwise you'd miss it. Yeah. And she said something about uh, 
catching glimpses of things out of the corner of your eye when you're reading it. And again, that is the kind of thing that I have in mind. So it's magic is much more of, of a tool, but at the same time, there is one word that you will never read in any of those eight books. And that one word is magic. Okay. Wow. <clears throat> That's fascinating. And I love that uh, you, you've got that play coming back and forth between the readers who are telling you things that are just what you're looking for, but also um, you know, what you're wanting them to read into, but also it, seems, it feels like it's kind of giving you a little bit of like, uh, you know what, you're right at the same time. And, and that's, that's awesome that you got readers who are feeding into the story of, of what you're looking to do with new blood. So that's, that's amazing. It really is. And having, sometimes people mention things and I was like, Whoa, you saw that. <laughs> and that also is a great thing. And, and one of the things that, you know, in terms of how I write that, a lot of people, there are writers out there who criticize me because I don't outline my books. I have an idea of where they're going, but I don't write a physical outline. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is if it surprises me and I'm the one writing it, it'll definitely surprise readers. Yeah. And in my opinion. And so there are things where I will go through and I'll get an idea and I'll, I'll write that. And, and it's, but that affects something that happened earlier. So I, I go back and I rewrite that. And I'm okay with it. I, I completely agree. I, I'm the same way. I used to try to do outlines. I spent years spinning my wheels trying to outline my first book. And it just got me nowhere. I was rewriting the first couple of chapters over and over again and trying to think of the outline. And I finally just I, I finally just put it all down one day. And it was just in time for NaNoWriMo. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to feel the book out and let it tell me where it's supposed to go and see if I can't do this. And, and I did, I was able to do it in NaNoWriMo. I just kind of felt my way through it. And that's what I've done ever since. Like I know where, I know where the book's supposed to go. I know, usually I know how it's supposed to end, but I just don't know the journey to get there. And, and it's a lot of fun to discover it along the way. Oh, absolutely. And it, it, if, if you're planning it, if you're planning something that's supposed to be creative and, and, and all that, and you're, you put so much time into planning it, it takes the spontaneity out of it. And to me, that's just not as fun. Yeah. And I had a, an author who uh, I told him I don't outline my books. And he started telling me that boiled down in a nutshell in one sentence, I'm not a real writer. And, <laughs> and I just said, well, what fun is that? Yeah and shut him right up. I don't know what to say. So it's, uh, and there are people who have said things like that to me and it's just, well, we all have our method. Yeah. That, and that's, that's the whole thing right there is, and it's, I'd say respectfully, I think a, a writer who has to have rules to write by, well, I can't say they're not a real writer because like you said, they have their own methods. So that's, that's, maybe that's the best way to put it is <laughs> like you said, they all have, everybody has their own methods and some of us have rules and some of us don't, but uh, you're still telling the story and that's what matters. Right. So, well, so you've got eight books planned with new blood. Uh, you've got the sci-fi coming out in December. What was the name of that again? Pale face. Pale face. Okay. Now how does, how does pale face, how does that name fit in with a sci-fi that's interesting well the main character is a he's kind of a classic um I, I don't want to say fish out of water but he doesn't fit in he doesn't fit he is born on a reservation in new mexico and but he went to white man's school and then so he's he, his education is different than his peers, and, but he is still trying to hold on to, to elements of, of his uh, culture and his history. And then uh, what happens is that he has a, 
uh, interaction, let's call it an interaction, with a UFO. And it's, I've described it as a interstellar traffic accident. And he is hit by a UFO and severely injured. And then the rest of the story is him trying to get his mind around it. And one of the things that uh, Dave Wolverton said about it, um, he's a, he's a uh, pretty famous author in, in my opinion, but he said how he loves how the main character Hector compares it in the end, Hector ends up comparing these aliens who are very pale to uh, a lot of things that have happened in history between the Indians and and uh, and the white man. That he puts the aliens and the white man in the same category, and so that's where it comes in. Is that he is talking about? He's in his mind. He's thinking about these aliens, and and they're very pale. And then he just stops and and kind of laughs and says they're pale faces, hmm. but, but that's how the title came about. And so there's a lot of, of contradiction in terms of story and uh, characterization, but it's him trying to figure out what happened to him and deal with it. And that he, in essence, is the smoking gun for proof that alien life exists. Okay. Wow, that sounds fascinating. So what uh, once the sci-fi is out and book three is out, I'm assuming uh, you've got book four from New Blood. Any Anything else? Or are you looking to uh, stretch your writing <clears throat> abilities anymore? Well, I've got... <laughs> I'm always writing. I'm <laughs> always writing. And it's one of those things that... Uh, a few summers ago, we had a, a, a high school reunion, and my first book had uh, just come out, and all these people coming up to me and saying how they remembered me walking around with my red three-ring binder, and how I would just stop someplace and write, or you know, being having it with me at lunch and just writing, or you know, that sort of thing. They always saw me writing at the drop of a hat and always having that with me. I didn't know that it was that obvious, but that is what it was. And I still have that three ring binder, as a matter of fact, beat to death, but I've still got it. And so uh, I'm always writing something. And a lot of the stuff right now that with working on the books being published and, and putting in all the time and effort in terms of promoting the work, I'm not doing as much new writing as much as, as bringing the existing work up to, to, you know, par. And the thing with that is that my wife, uh, I, I guess this isn't that uncommon, but I read my stuff to my wife and she calls them her bedtime stories. Mm -hmm. And right now, since there isn't as much new stuff being written, she's not getting her bedtime stories. And she reminds me of that fairly often that she misses her bedtime stories. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but um, I've, I've got novels that are in the bullpen. I've got 20 or so, 25 that are sitting there waiting to get the same treatment as these. Outstanding. Well, where can people go to find out more about you and follow you? Um, my website is killpack.net. That's K-I-L-P-A-C-K.net. And that has information about my books, uh, information about me, if you care. Uh, it's got links so that you can order it on various platforms. It's got links to interviews and podcasts. And, and uh, it's kind of the communication hub for my dreams. Yeah, it's a fantastic website. I love all the links on here and all the uh, I, it's something you did is something that uh, I do as well as I put up any kind of interviews and that I've been on. And that's a great way to share the uh, not only the, you know, that uh, you've been on another show, but also to share the love with that show itself and keep them uh, keep them going too, keep some exposure for that show. So that's fantastic. And good. Glad to see that you do that. And well, you have your, your good reads as well. I see that's I meant to follow you on there. Well, that's awesome. 
Yeah, I, I, the thing with the podcast and all that is that if they're willing, you know, like yourself, if you're willing to try and, and, you know, help me, then I'll absolutely try to, to help back. And so, you know, it, there, there's enough animosity in the world. And so if you've got, you know, people that you can just work together and, and try to make things better for everyone involved, then why not? I couldn't have said that better myself, and I agree with you. Um, rising tide raises all ships. That's the whole idea behind this uh, behind this show is to try and highlight authors like yourself and find uh, you know just give us give us all a, a platform to to share and uh, talk to everybody. Hey, man, thank you so much for coming on. And by the way, I want to wish you a uh, a happy belated birthday. I saw yours was just a couple of days ago. Mine's coming up in a few days myself. So a uh, happy belated birthday and, uh, and good luck with book three coming out. Well, thank you. So, all right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, time for me to step aside and hand the floor over to our guest, W.D. Kilpack with book one of the New Blood Saga, Crown Prince. Crown Prince by W.D. Kilpack III. You, Nils gasped, incredulous, his voice breaking. Anyone but you. Your disappointment will not last long. Nathar struck, sword starting high, then altering course to slash almost straight down, each motion mechanical, automatic from years of training. Nils made to parry the high stroke, then followed the downstroke, partially blocking it. Nathar's point sliced through the edge of the captain's thigh, pushing down the metal plate that had been intended to protect it, spilling bright red on the hardwood floor. The captain's eyes widened as his legs sagged, no longer able to support his weight. Nathar's sword whipped back up, then stabbed straight toward the other's throat, efficient as a striking adder. Niels twisted at the shoulders and snatched at the blade with his free hand while he fell, his leg buckling under him. His grip on Nathar's sword blade held, his arm trembling while his skin paled. Red ran in a thick rivulet from his hand down the blood gutters on either side of the blade. Why? Neil scarcely whispered, staring up at Nathar. A tendril of bloody blonde hair peeled away from his brow and fell away. Gods have mercy on you, guardian. Your sight is true. I hope you have read it rightly. Nathar did not so much as blink as he yanked back on his sword, and two of the blonde man's fingers fell to the floor, blood spurting into the air. At the same moment, Niels lunged forward, yelling, Belaine! Nathar twisted at the waist, evading the stab meant for his heart, and sunk his own sword point into the side of the captain's neck. There was a pained cry, a woman's voice, from behind him. Niels toppled toward the ground, sword clanging as his dead fingers released it. The fresh corpse's weight pulled at the guardian's sword until he lifted the pommel, and the body thumped heavily to the hardwood. Nathar lifted his newly bloodied blade, face neutral. Then he blinked, cold expression melting away as he turned. Darshell was there, back bowed forward and arms clenched protectively over the baby. A wide slash across her back ran from one shoulder blade to the other. Red already rolled down from the cut and thick rivulets brightly soaking her white shirt. Had she not turned to the side to cover the baby with her body, she and Vicari both probably would have been run through. Nathar, she said, voice weak, and stumbled forward a step. Nathar? Voices rose all around them. He was not sure if all had gone silent to watch the guardian of Merrick fight the captain of the guard to the death, or if he simply had not heard them while enveloped in the melee. Demons of chaos, he roared, catching her elbow and dragging her forward. Stupid woman, I told you to go. I, I tried. You did not try, he yelled, kicking the door to the kitchen so hard that it came free of its hinges. Then he understood. Two bearded men were there with bloodied axes. Two of Elaine's soldiers were there as well, on their knees. Their bowed heads rose as Nathar entered, and the axemen lifted their weapons. Lord Nathar, the two men gasped, seeing the blood in his sword. The relief in their voices was a physical blow. 
I tried, Darshell repeated, but her voice was weak. Nathar glanced at her. Her skin, normally dusky to the point of being the color of copper, was much more pale. His emerald gaze returned to the men he had surprised. The axemen were afraid, both stepping backward. Vilaine's men were smiling, despite the blood soaking one sleeve and smearing half the other's face. Nathar crossed the kitchen in two steps, dragging Darshell with him, threw open the door to the cellar, and was through. He bolted the door and headed down the stairs before anyone could even raise a cry of alarm. He wanted to take the steps two or three at a time, but Darshell was fighting him, both because she could not see and because she was weakening. He could tell by the way her resistance declined with each step. You killed him. Her. Them both, she finally managed, then lost her footing. She screamed, but Nathar kept her on her feet with his free hand. As if in response, he heard a cry of pain and a wild voice crying, Nathar! Alright, that was W.D. Kilpat III reading a sample chapter from Book 1 of the New Blood Saga, Crown Prince. Uh, the book is available right now. You can pick up the first two books, Crown Prince and Order of Light. And don't forget that Book 3, Demon Seed, with that amazing cover... Uh, that's coming out real soon here in just a couple of weeks in December. So hop on over to his website. Uh, the link is in the show notes too, so that you don't miss out. Hey, don't forget to also click the link in the show notes for our sponsors and podcast friends alike. And hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss out next time when I'm back with a all new author, a new book, and a brand new sample chapter. Take care, everyone. Be healthy and have a happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>